This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on insurance. I am an attorney who has retired from the active practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant, an insurance claims expert witness, an author, and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to talk about the concurrent cause doctrine. The concurrent cause doctrine holds that if more than one cause occurred to cause a loss, one of which is excluded and the other is not, the entire loss is covered. It was finalized and first stated by the California Supreme Court in a case called State Farm Mutual Auto Insurance Company v. Partridge in 1973. In this case, the court found that coverage existed for defense and indemnity under a homeowner's policy, even though the accident occurred while the insured was operating an automobile, excluded by the homeowner's policy because there was a non-excluded event that concurred to cause the loss. The facts of the Partridge case illustrate how the concurrent cause doctrine was born out of an outrageous fact situation and the potentiality doctrine first enunciated in Gray v. Zurich, another California leading Supreme Court case dealing with the duty to defend. The insured Partridge hunted rabbits from his pickup truck with a two three fifty seven Magnum pistol, perhaps a little more powerful than needed. One night at home, he filed down the trigger on his pistol so that it had a hair trigger. Then he and a friend went out hunting in the truck, scaring up rabbits in an open field. The gun sat on the bench seat between the insured and his friend. The truck hit a bump. The gun bounced on the seat, and because of the hair trigger, it discharged and shot the passenger. The injuries from such a large weapon were understandably severe. Partridge had minimal liability coverage of $15,000 on his automobile and a limit of 25000 on his homeowner's policy. The plaintiff was severely injured and could not be made whole by the payment of either policy limit. Both the insured's auto policy and his homeowner's policy were written by State Farm. Partridge demanded defense and indemnity from both policies. State Farm accepted the defense on the auto policy but refused to defend or indemnify under the homeowner's policy because it clearly and unambiguously excluded loss resulting from the use of an automobile. State Farm reasoned that the gun would not have discharged at all if it was not bounced around in the insured's truck. They made a logical interpretation of the policy, which, unfortunately for State Farm, the Supreme Court later concluded was wrong. The Supreme Court found that there were two causes for the loss, which had to concur to cause the plaintiff injury. First, filing the hair trigger, and second, driving over an open field with a gun on the seat. Coverage was provided under both policies, since both causes concurred in the loss, and since they could not be separated from each other, the court would not admit it, but the severity of the injury incurred by the plaintiff, coupled with the egregious negligence of the insured, could have weighed heavily in the creation of this concurrent cause doctrine. There would have been no need to create a concurrent cause doctrine if either the automobile or the homeowner's policy had a $1 million limit. The court would have applied its earlier stated rule of efficient proximate cause and found applicable the policy with the $1 million policy limit. This is not meant as a criticism of the court, but it is, rather recognition of the humanity of justices of the Supreme Court, who occasionally find themselves reasoning backward to what they perceive is a fair result. Third-party liability policies can apply the concurrent cause doctrine in California, therefore, while first-party policies 
after many years of litigation after the Partridge case, may not. It appears that the proponents of the concurrent cause doctrine, at least with regard to first-party policies, are losing ground not only in California but in other states, although some still apply it in first-party property cases. For instance, the Supreme Court of Michigan refused to adopt the concurrent cause rationale in Vanguard v. Clark uh, in 1991 decision, yet said in Haley v. Allstate Insurance Company, a 2004 decision, that, quote, Michigan has no precedential authority expressly adopting or denying the theory of dual or concurrent causation. As the Allstate policy expressly provides for governance governance under this doctrine, it is unnecessary to determine whether Michigan must adopt the doctrine as a matter of policy to dispose of this case. For purposes of interpreting the contract, it is necessary to discuss the doctrine. In Tennessee, in a case called Hall and Hawkins v. National Fire, the court said, quote, that the weight of the authority is to the effect that where the fire occurs at the property insured and an explosion takes place therein during the progress of the fire, the effects of which are covered by the policy and such explosion is a mere incident of the preceding fire, the latter is treated as the efficient cause and the whole loss is within the risk insured although the policy in terms excludes liability for loss by explosion. In Allstate v. Watts, a 1991 Tennessee case, the Court of Appeals insisted on applying the efficient proximate cause rule, stating that the cause that puts all others in motion is the cause that determines coverage. Adjuster or claims investigator should when faced with a concurrent cause situation, seek the advice of experienced coverage counsel in the state in which the adjuster practices, because there is no consistent causation rule across the United States. The majority of the courts in the country follow the concurrent cause doctrine in third-party liability situations, with a lesser number also following it in both third-party and first-party property cases. In Gonzalez v. St. Paul Mercury, a 1976 California Court of Appeal case, the court found that regardless of an exclusion for liability arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or operation of an automobile, an accident was covered under a homeowner's policy when one of the concurrent causes of the accident was the negligent repair of the brakes of the automobile. The trial court found that, one, the acts complained of did not occur on the premises of Ernest Martinez, two, the occurrence as defined in the policy of insurance took place when plaintiff's son was struck and not when the repairs to the braking system were made approximately one month before. Three, the ownership, maintenance, use, and operation of the motor vehicle which caused the death was away from the premises of Ernest Martinez. And four, the repair work on the braking system of the vehicle was use and maintenance of the vehicle within the terms of the policy. With such facts as the basis of its decision, the Court of Appeals stated, quote, the liability of the insured arose from two concurrent causes, the use of the auto and the negligent repair of the brakes on the premises. Coverage was available, therefore, under the homeowner's policy because a concurrent cause of the accident was not excluded by the homeowner's policy. Every adjuster, every claims investigator, every insurance lawyer should apply a healthy skepticism when interpreting a policy. Sometimes, The reasonable and logical interpretation is correct. Often, it is not. In Blackfield v. Underwriters at Lloyd's, a 1966 case of the California Court of Appeal, 
The insureds were home builders who included defective materials into homes they constructed. The plaintiffs discovered that the respondents had so defectively constructed the foundation of their home and compacted the fill on which it was placed that the foundation had settled unevenly, causing the house to slant, the stucco portion of the house to crack, and the windows and sliding doors not to open or close properly. Although almost all of the allegations of the complaint were for causes specifically excluded by the Lloyd's policy, the Court of Appeal concluded that since the duty to defend is broader than the duty to indemnify, Lloyd's was required to defend the insured. The Court further held that where there is doubt as to whether the duty to defend exists, the doubt should be resolved in favor of the insured. If there is a potentiality for recovery under the policy, the duty to defend is present. That is, if there is damage to a non-defective part of the structure, the insurer must provide a defense for the damage resulting from the defective part. Because of exclusions in most CGL policies, there is no coverage for damage to the defective part only for the damage to other property caused by the defective part of the structure. The court refused to conclude that the home was, as a unit, defective. In Hamilton Diecast v. United States F&G Co., a 1975 case uh, from the Seventh Circuit, the insured manufactured tennis racket frames. The frames were defective. The court found there was no property damage since the only thing that was damaged was the product manufactured by the insured. There was no damage to any third party or the property of a third party. The insured withdrew the tenor's racket frames from the market when the individuals who incorporated the defective part into the frame sued the insured. The insured was not entitled to a defense because there was neither the requisite bodily injury nor was there property damage. However, if that defect was alleged to have caused damage to a person or property, a duty to defend would have existed. In Hogan v. Midland National, the Seventh Circuit concluded, quote, The policy does not, however, cover an occurrence of alleged negligent manufacture. It covers negligent manufacture that results in an occurrence. Plaintiffs strained interpretations aside, the Midland complaint would not support a reasonable belief that Midland's damages were the result of an occurrence within the definition of the policy. Close quote. If one of several causes of action alleged against an insured is covered. In most states, the insurer is bound to defend the entire action. Refusing to find facts that would support a concurrent cause conclusion, the appellate court of Connecticut held that the plaintiff insurer was not obligated under a homeowner's insurance policy to defend and indemnify the defendant insured in an underlying tort action for his alleged failure to render aid after a motor vehicle accident. The homeowner's policy contained an exclusions for acts arising out of the use of a motor vehicle. The issue was whether injuries sustained as a result of a failure to render aid after an accident, as alleged in the underlying action, fell under the rubric of the exclusion. The appellate court found they did since the motor vehicle accident was the operative event, giving rise to the injuries. The court reversed the trial court in part and directed judgment for the plaintiff insurer. The court said, in the present case, it is clear that pursuant to Hogel, a precedential case in the court, any injuries that Robert Choquette allegedly sustained as a result of Kelly's failure to render aid to him arose out of Kelly's use of his motor vehicle. This decision indicates reluctance on the part of courts outside of California to limit the application of the concurrent doctrine to situations where there is no doubt that both causes acted independently to cause the injury. 
Some insurers have included a concurrent cause exclusion. In Florida, an anti-concurrent cause provision is a provision in a first-party insurance policy that provides that when a covered cause and another and non-covered cause combine to cause a loss, all losses directly and indirectly caused by those events are excluded from coverage. This video was adapted from my book, Zelma on Insurance Claims, Part 105, Second Edition, available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com, and by clicking on the Insurance Claims Library at Zelma on Insurance at, at Zelma.com. If you found this video to be of interest and useful to you, please send it to your colleagues and subscribe to my blog so that you can be informed about future videos and future blog posts summarizing and digesting insurance law cases. Thank you again for your attention.